simple as it is it can be easily applied in uh, medical laboratories because uh, whenever we heard this word risk it comes to our mind that something very complicated or what we have to do like so many things in our minds so i will just uh, try to put the complicated things in a simple way i am a senior consultant and head of the department in sitaram bhartia institute of science and research uh, this is the place is where i work so first of all before starting the theory part just carefully watch this video or this video and watch the step baby is doing yeah <clears throat> just a sec yeah so i will like to know that what all please write in the chat box that what all did you notice in this video did you enjoy this Yeah, please write in the chat box what all this baby is trying to do. Am I audible to everyone? Yeah, please write in the chat box. Am I audible? so? Uh, I would like to just know what this baby is. <clears throat> yeah 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 trying to jump out pillow to get off the bed and see how beautifully this small baby is assessing the risk that if i get down how much risk is there that i will fall i will not be hurt and in the simple steps the baby is first of all identifying that there is a risk of falling from the bed and if i get down i want to get down this is my aim that i want to get down off the bed and how much risk is there the baby is assessing the risk the baby is calculating how many pillows will be required and he drops down three pillows then he checks also by throwing his pillow down that whether the risk has been controlled or not and then finally he gets down so see the simple steps are there but small baby is able to do that so why not we we just have to understand in a simple way so first of all when we heard this word risk and sometimes the people say that the bhai bahut there is a risk to every activity so um whenever we are working in laboratories there are so many 
processes we are handling, so many procedures we are handling, so many things we are handling. So what we require, we have to, we should assess the risk associated with the activities that these activities would not result in harm to the patient and to the employees or the staff, to the patient reports, to the users. So first of all, what we have to do is we have to define what we want to do. We have to define the risk statement. So the overall goal, goal what is the goal? What are we trying to achieve in this activity? To reduce adverse consequences to an acceptable level because this risk cannot be always mitigated. It will be reduced to an acceptable level for every activity in the laboratory, be it analytical, pre-analytical, post-analytical. So what we understand is the first thing is target, objective, goal. What is the output which we are trying to achieve? Only one thing is clear in our mind, then only we can proceed. How can we further go ahead? So uh, when we talk about risk, there are few frequently used terms associated with that. First of all, the risk. Risk is what? It is basically potential harm, which has not occurred, but there is chance that something can go wrong. So when we say risk, it is harm that can occur, that is potential due to vulnerability, deviation that can be avoided or that can be minimized by preemptive actions. So there is one more term which will we will uh, further down the lane learn that what is failure mode? Failure mode is the manner in which a process could be could potentially fail. We have to foresee that. We can just think about that. We can brainstorm our team, sit together and learn what all potential modes of failure can be estimated in expected in the process which we are going to assess. There will be one more term, FME, FEMA, which is failure mode. Uh, sorry, it is uh, uh, wrongly written. FMEA, it is failure mode and effect analysis. One more term we frequently listen is fishbone diagram. It is basically we have to jot down the causes. So it is a way where we where easily we can see how many, what are the root causes which are responsible for this particular risk. So we'll go uh, one by one. So what we can see in the slide is it is a normal working laboratory where these are the routine mandatory processes, be it a small lab or it is a large lab. These all process steps will be there definitely. So what is it starts from the request from the clinician or the user. The This is received in the collection area. The samples are being collected, then transported to the receiving area. In the receiving area, these are transported to the preparation area where registration is being done in the laboratory information system. Then examinations are being done, interpretation of results is done, reporting is there. If there are some critical results, these are informed. And finally, it is the results are ready for clinician or patients use. So these all step, steps are there, but when we see this, the other slide, all the steps are same except what is added. We have added procedures and processes to every step, a defined uh, implementation of these processes at every step. So the difference between the previous slide and this slide is that it is more defined. Everything is well implemented, well established. So what will happen? The things will be done in a standardized manner and every person in the lab will be doing the same activity in the same manner, which has been already estimated and analyzed and then put in service. So what will we, what we are doing is that we are already putting our some existing control measures in place so that the activities happen in the desired way what we want. So this is a good laboratory practice. So when we come to the definition of risk management, it is as per ISO 14971, that systematic application, just pay attention to the words. 
systematic application of management. There are three P's, policies, procedures, and practices. To the task of, now again, we can use this acronym as AECM, analyzing. Just remember these words and the whole risk activity will be covered. Analyzing, evaluating, controlling, and monitoring risk. So systematic application of management policies, procedures, and practices, which we have seen in the previous slide, to a task of analyzing, evaluating, controlling, and monitoring risk. So we can say this is a process that involves anticipation. So we are just anticipating. We have not met with, the, with any harm. So the process that involves anticipating what could go wrong, the errors. Assessing the probability of occurrence of these errors, very, very important terms. The probability, the whole story will revolve around that only, the probability of occurrence of these errors, then the consequences or severity of harm that they cause, and finally, what can be done to reduce the risk of potential harm to an acceptable level. You just need not need to understand the terms. There is no requirement that we learn all these terms by heart, but we need to understand. So what is risk? In the simple way, it is just a measure of severity of impact of a potential error multiplied by probability of its occurrence. It is the whole story. So what is there? What we can see? In the pictures here, there is risk they, these people are taking. They are not estimating the lady is driving a two-wheeler, talking on phone without helmet. The person is crossing the road, seeing busy in the mobile phone, crossing the road without anticipating that what is coming. He's not assessing. There are three people riding a bicycle without helmet. So these are all risk activities which is there. So we can understand that the concept of risk is not new at all. And thanks to Dr. Neeraj Jain for this pretty slide that it summarizes the whole thing. Why we are so worried about that? The concept of risk is not new. It is just new to us, to the healthcare, because now the standard also wants us that we should, we should align our systems that nothing should go wrong. We should minimize the activities that risk should be minimized to an acceptable level. So why are we talking about all these things in medical laboratories? Why is risk management important for all medical laboratories? Because the tests are performed only once. We are performing, releasing the results, which will be, which will be used for clinical interpretation, which will be used for interference, clinical interference, for the management of patients. So we analyze many samples from which we derive information, quite relevant information. The information impacts upon the decision-making and health of others. Poor information can lead to poor outcomes. It is a basic requirement of the standard now. It is the requirement of regulatory bodies also. That is why it is important for medical laboratories to learn that. <clears throat> So what all we lose, the laboratory errors, if we do not minimize, they cost us time, they cost personal effort and the patient outcomes. So when we say that the standard requirement, it is the mother, the mother standard, the Bible of the medical laboratories is ISO 15189, the 2022 version. It is medical laboratories requirement for quality and competence, which asks which tells us guides us that what is all required these are all mandatory activities which are required another standard very good standard beautifully written about the risk which my presentation is mainly based on this standard only and it is iso 122367-2020 which talks about medical laboratories application of risk management to medical laboratories so now we have two standards, quality management framework, which tells about tells us and risk management framework. So the quality management framework, we learn quality competence, continual improvement and prevention and the risk management framework, the analysis and calculation of risk reduction. So we join together, the two hands join together 
helps us a lot. I'm sorry, I today I am having a very bad throat. So I'll be uh, just having a sips of water in between. Kindly excuse me for that. So when we say the 15189-2022, what are the clauses which talk about this? It is clause 5.6, which de in detail tells us that risk management is required. The laboratory management shall establish, implement, and maintain processes. So we have to maintain some processes to identify risk. We should learn opportunities of improvement in patient care. The laboratory director is responsible. Who is responsible for that? The laboratory director or head of laboratory or whatever we call as the senior person, the overall person in charge is responsible for all the process development. Then there is 8.5, which says that Physics should be identified and opportunities for improvement should be identified. So lab shall identify risk and opportunities for improvement associated with the laboratory activity to prevent or reduce undesired impacts of potential failures to achieve improvement, to assure that management system achieves its intended results, to mitigate risk to patient care, to help achieve the purpose and objectives of laboratory. And then we, when we address a few risk activities, definitely there is opportunity of for improvement in any activity. This will lead us to improvement level. So as has been said by Mr. Henry, that it takes less time to do things right than to explain why you did it wrong. So there'll be a whole lot of process when some activities goes wrong, we have to do root cause analysis, we have to correct that. So it's better that we take some activity, we interfere before something goes wrong. So now comes to, I come to the main topic, the risk management process, which we have learned that 5.6 tells us that we have to develop a risk management process. So there are six steps in total. The risk management plan is to be developed, risk analysis to be done, risk evaluation, risk control, risk management review, and risk monitoring. So one by one, I will proceed on that. So this is according to 31,000, The process flow chart we can prepare like this the establishing the context, which we have talked about that we have to define the risk statement, then identification of the risk, second step. Then we have to do analysis, risk analysis. Risk analysis is nothing but determining the likelihood and the consequence of the activity, which will give us the estimate of the risk level. Then based on that, we, we can evaluate the risk with the existing criteria followed by treatment of that risk. Along with that side by side goes the monitoring and management review and the communication. So when we say an assessment, assessment is comprising of risk analysis plus evaluation. So an and evening. So this is the acronym which can use an evening analysis plus evaluation is risk assessment. So this is uh, from 22367, which I have taken the process flow, very simple process, which we can do, identify the risk, identify the existing control measures if they are there. If you are starting a new activity, there may not be any control, but if you are just assessing your existing activity, you may have certain control measures in place, then evaluate the risk. Assess the likelihood and probability, severity and consequence. Calculate the risk which we will learn down the lane. Calculate the risk. Rank the risk accordingly, the very low, low, medium, high or very high. Depending upon the level of risk, take action if it is required or not. If it is not required, nothing is there. If it is medium or very high, take actions accordingly, urgently or high priority or medium priority. Implement the control measures which will be discussed in your 
management meeting reevaluate the risk again if again there is something which is the residual risk is not acceptable take some action if it is acceptable go ahead so first step starts it is risk management plan what do we understand by plan the plan says that define the scope of the risk analysis what are we going to assess it is is it related to pre analytical is it related to sample collection is it related to transport like dr sujata has told her in her presentation very beautifully that transport related risk has to be undertaken in the pre analytical part is it related to some reporting is it related to some billing so we have to define the scope because there will be hundred of risk in the laboratory but we cannot address every risk at a time so define the scope first of all what are we going to assess what are we going to work upon then go move forward assign responsibilities and authorities who will be responsible for what and what authorities will be given to whom specify clearly risk management reviews what all will be done once the management plan once the monitoring plan once the control plan is established what will we review what will be our criteria after that define criteria for risk acceptability because once we are going to take some action it is not going to be mitigated 100% so there will be definitely some residual risk so we have to accept the risk to a certain level specify what will be the verification criteria that risk has been catered the activity has been undertaken what will be the risk monitoring criteria what all documentation will be required what all documentation will be maintained by us because every laboratory will have different documentation so in the plan itself you define that then comes step 2 the risk analysis what is risk analysis i have told you systematic use of available information to identify hazard what is the hazard what is wrong there and estimate the risk we can say it higher identify hazard and estimate risk it is risk analysis so you know it has been told that hazard is if it is there it is not going to pose harm it is the subsequent activities which which imposes harm so hazard itself it is sitting there in the corner but further activities have to be seen to prevent this hazard to result into harm so according to the definitions hazard cannot result in harm until exposure to hazard occurs if a acid bottle is kept there in the corner it is not going to cause hazard but if we open it throw it on some person it will be hazard so this hazardous situation does not occur we have to work on that so we have to now there were two terms identify risk and estimate risk now what is that so identify risk is by anticipating what could go wrong it is whole the brainstorming activity among the team the team leaders the frontliners because these people are the main users of activity if a phlebotomist who is involved in sample collection activity the idea which this phlebotomist can give you the lead the lab director cannot give you what can go wrong because they are the first handers so it it is decided identified by anticipating what can go wrong what are the circumstances or scenarios that can be realistically expected to occur that may lead to injury or ill health or threat to patient or employee safety it can be done by reviewing the failure of the processes which we have already faced so <clears throat> when our the unwanted circumstances likely to arise so we have to just foresee that we have to anticipate that so risk can be identified on the basis from inputs from our uh, various departmental discussions the mock hurdles which are very very relevant very very important the hurdles activities the communication user feedback 
daily observations of the laboratory, inputs from the team, the staff suggestions, internal audits, and before introducing new processes, we can identify risk. These are the common areas in a clinical lab where risk can be found. The infrastructure, layout, the toilet, flooring, furniture, flooring, maybe slippery flooring, the furniture, maybe the corners are sharp and every time person moves in and out, it is hurting people. The staff, the competency is not there. The credentials are not there. If a person who is uh, just not uh, qualified, MLT basic requirement is there and the person is not there. He, the person has joined the laboratory because of some push or pull. The equipment, they are not functioning, not up to mark. IT, laboratory information system, the, it is not strong. The cyber security is not there. Some hardware issues, some software issues we can expect. The reagents, consumables, QC materials, disposables, like Dr. Jata ma'am has told that every vacutainer lot is to be confirmed. The culture bottles, the swabs. So these are the areas we can anticipate the risk situation. Now, the second term was risk estimation. What is that? <clears throat> so it is basically assigning a value to the probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. We, we have learned two terms in the whole, stand, whole slide still now that probability of occurrence and severity of harm. So we have to estimate that. We have to assign a value. How we do that? I will... We just learned that. Various methods can be used, but standard does not require any particular method. There are so many methods available on the Google, on the various sites, but 22367 does not tell that any particular method is used. There are few guidelines, few, few suggestions, few examples, which uh, most commonly are used, which will be summarized here. So there are two terms. One, which we can help us, which 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 can, which can help us in estimating the risk is using risk matrix, and there is one more which we have learned earlier also FMA failure mode analysis. So failure mode analysis tells us RPN the risk probability uh, re relative priority uh, risk pro uh, risk priority number. So I, I will just uh, go there. So estimating the probability of harm now, we have to assign a number. How do that? How to do that? So standards give some examples. The overall probability of harm scale we can define from one to five if we say that the measuring scale is from one to five. There are other scales also available, one to three, one to 10, but most frequently we use this. This is a semi-quantitative assessment that we can assign to each activity. <clears throat> saying that level five is when the error is expected to occur frequently, like description may we can say it is each day it is occurring. And likewise, <clears throat> level four, it is reasonably likely each week it is ha happening. Then comes number three, occasional, every month. It is expected to occur. Number two, remote each year. Number one, unlikely, less than once in a year. Similarly, qualitatively also we can assess every time it's not the number which we can say that every month it will occur or each day it will occur. So we can just uh, assign qualitatively also from one to five, saying one five is the frequent likely to occur regularly with the examination procedures. And it is expected to be experienced continuously in laboratory. <clears throat> Reasonably likely is likely to occur multiple times with the examination procedures. Expected to be experienced frequently in the laboratory. Occasional, likely to occur sometimes and expected to be experienced several times. <clears throat> Remote, unlikely. And finally, unlikely, it is... Ex <laughs> Uh, 
I'm sorry. So it is extremely unlikely to occur in the laboratory. So then comes the severity of harm scale. <clears throat> Again, from one to five, five is critical, life-threatening injury or death. It may result in that. Four, serious, permanent or reversible bodily damage or impairment. Number three, significant, non-permanent damage <laughs> or impairment, which is reversible. <clears throat> Just excuse me for a second. Number three, significant non-permanent bodily damage or reversible with medical intervention. Number two, marginal or temporary, really, temporary body damage, which is reversible with, without medical intervention and negligible, only temporary discomfort. <clears throat> uh, so when after identifying and the probability and severity of harm. Now we have few figures, number five from five to one. So the probability if we say is A and the severity if we say is B. And if we multiply A and B, it will tell us the inherent risk level associated with that particular activity. And then we can find further proceed. So number three comes the risk evaluation. So what is evaluation is a process of comparing estimated risk, which we have estimated against given risk criteria to determine the acceptability of the risk. So it is a process of comparing estimated risk against given criteria. So probability is how frequent and the severity is how severe it is going to be. So likewise, we can just make this grid risk matrix, which we call, and we can define, which we have already defined in the management plan that what will be our risk acceptability criteria, where we have to address this risk, whether it falls in high category or low category or medium category. On this grid scale, we can learn when we place that particular risk in the grid scale, we can assess, we can say that if it is the score is 25, it is a high risk, we need to take action. So we can define in the zone wise, red zone, yellow zone, a few examples, you will see that red zone, yellow zone and green, gray, green zone. So green means there is no risk. Uh, red means there is high risk and yellow means there is a low risk. And if we when we uh, make a plan, we initiate from the starting itself, we have to define what will be our risk acceptance line. Like in this figure, we can say that 10, the score 10 or above 10 is the high risk area and any risk falling in this zone will be taken. And again, it tells us that which is the highest one which we have to take. Like if the score is 25, this is this should be tackled first because it will result, it is a critical condition and the frequently occurring condition. That is why the score is high. So likewise, if the score is 20, the second one, and we can move forward. <clears throat> so this grid helps us which is to be taken first and which may not be taken at all. So next comes the risk estimation, which I had <clears throat> mentioned in the beginning that, that Another method which we can assess the estimate the risk is using failure mode and effect analysis, wherein all the two steps of probability and severity are same. The another step which is added is detectability. So what is failure mode? The, there are so many FMEA, you know, they are available, which are like design FMEA or application FMEA or system FMEA. But process FMEA is the most uh, comfortable one and defined in the standard also more uh, in detail. And that's why we'll just learn this. <clears throat> so process FMEA is, so a uh, possible failure modes, first of all, are identified when we apply, when we handle any risk activity by FMEA process. 
So we have to identify the possible failure modes, which we were doing earlier also, which how we have to do is by brainstorming in a team format. We sit together, discuss on that particular process, identify what failure modes will be there. What is failure mode? Potential effect of, what will be the potential effect of that failure mode? We have to identify that. So what we can expect from the activities that is failure mode. What, what are the manners the risk will be happening in, down the lane? <clears throat> and what will be the potential effects of each failure mode? You know, when it is a long process, there will be multiple failure modes. So, <clears throat> <laughs> so that is why <laughs> this process of MA is important when a process is being assessed <clears throat> because there will be multiple steps where we can anticipate that failure modes will be there. So each failure mode is given a severity and the likelihood and then the detectability measure which is assessed by what all existing controls measures are there. So that will tell us that how what is the easiest way that this particular error can be detected whether do we have any control existing control in place or not <clears throat> so again if it is a scale is given for uh, helping us from one to five we can use one to ten scale also uh, people uh, both the ways can be uh, used we can scale it from one to ten or one to five but here we will just focus on this so uh, we say it low Ineffective detection. So C, when it is low, the rating is highest, 5. Again, less likely to detect is 4. Average or fair is 3. Good detectability is there too. And highest detectability is 1. So when we have all the three figures, we multiply all the three occurrence, <clears throat> severity and detectability, and we can scale it. So <clears throat> when we use this FMEA analysis, generally the 1 is to 10 score level grading scale is used and cutoff is kept at more than 100. If it is more than 100, we need to take some preventive action. So we have in the first slide only we have learned what is this fishbone diagram, very fancy term <clears throat> and very beautiful diagram also. People who love fish eat to have fish in the meals they will they always um, relish this so this is basically that helps us in just enlisting the causes uh, so that nothing is missed when we are enlisting our the causes of the that particular risk activity so we can say that there are m 6m man related to manpower personnel there can be uh, a few modes which will be related to machine equipment. There may be some methods, either the procedures are not defined, the pro SOPs are not defined, the reference ranges are not defined, the criteria acceptability are not defined. So there will be some measurement related errors or material related errors or maybe external environment which may be called as the mother nature. So I'll just give you a very simple example, which we can expect in every laboratory we are doing. So suppose there is a 24 hour laboratory and the laboratory is a small laboratory and majorly they are having uh, samples in the daytime. So what they have designed that morning may they will run the controls. And because the samples in the uh, evening hours or night hours are less, so they think that why to unnecessarily increase the extra cost of running controls, we should not do that. So some once uh, fair day, they, uh, they realize that no, because uh, QC run is not there. Many results which are released in the evening because it is a hospital-based laboratory, 24-7 laboratory. The results uh, process, the samples processed in the evening or late hours will be, if they are released, they may get, go wrong. It may go undetected. So this is a statement which is there. The situation, the mode is there. <clears throat> Failure mode is that they are not running QC. The problem is that and if something goes wrong, the patient results will be wrong. 
So the laboratory has enlisted so many causes, the protocol, like the, there is no existing protocol. That is why they are not running controls. There is no acceptance criteria defined, maybe. So maybe why it is important, maybe a new person joins in the evening hours who has been uh, put on duty in the evening hours. And if there is no process to identify that the results are correct, because QC is something which tells us that process is right or wrong. The reagents, the machine, everything is right or wrong. So person will process the sample, release the result. So there may be increased workload in the evening hours. And if the light, late night samples are reported wrong, that will be a problem. Maybe uh, there is equipment related errors. Uh, equipment related anticipate errors can be anticipated. Maybe some part change is there in the evening hours. And if the laboratory is not putting controls, the results will be wrong. We can anticipate that. Maybe some part goes wrong. <clears throat> Machine, maybe it goes, some breakdown happens. Maybe it is related to some material like new kit is there in the evening, new lot, new shipment, which has not been analyzed, lot acceptance has not been done. And if the technician runs using that kit, the samples may go wrong because they are not putting QC. There is no policy. The technician cannot go beyond that. <clears throat> there may be some environmental related issues like poor temperature in the evening. The AC is not working. The summers in Delhi, uh, the 45 temperature, uh, the regions go wrong. Sudden electricity failure, which may uh, occur and it may have effect on the working of the machine. So, so many causes we have enlisted. And this is because of the fishbone diagram that we can simply one by one go ahead. So, just one example of calculating the uh, RPN. See, in this laboratory, they have not defined a protocol. What we can say, the root cause are these three. The existing control measure, because they are not putting control, it is none. So detectability will be 10 because no low detectability is there. The occurrence may be 9 because they are not putting control. Every second sample may go wrong. You cannot expect on the basis of morning controls. If this ha happens, the severity will be high because it is a ICU lab, 24-7 laboratory, emergency patients would be there some sodium released uh, unexpectedly high, the results, the treatment will be completely wrong. So this will give us a figure of 900. Definitely action is required. <clears throat> what laboratory does is that the protocol defined definition is there. Laboratory defines WDI, all the acceptance criteria, very good stringent laboratory because it is so all criteria are defined, laboratory trains, trains the technicians, they use all validated reagents. So what will happen? The detectability will be now very good. So it will go down to one. Occurrence definitely will be less because we have defined the sample rejection, uh, QC rejection rules. So they will not process the sample. So occurrence will be less. But if it happens, the severity will remain same. <laughs> so laboratory, since it has taken the action beforehand, they have expected this and they have taken the action. They When they start running this laboratory samples, from the starting itself, if it is a 24-7 laboratory, they put controls. According to the QC rules, they accept and reject the QC runs. And the RPN will be 20. So like this, we can go in the system. So next comes the risk control step four. So what we have to do, we have to plan and score. And we have to apply the control options. Based on the position in the risk matrix tool, recite action plans to identify the quantity and type of resources, which will be required to carry out the actions, develop an action plan, Obtain management review, uh, management approval. Maybe sometimes you need some extra resource. Maybe you need some extra manpower. Maybe you need some extra machine. You need some extra quality control material for which you have to take approval, financial approval. And then do risk benefit analysis. Whether <clears throat> the risk is good or the finances are good. Whether we are going to be benefited will be higher or the 
letting it there will be higher. So accordingly, we can proceed. Then comes the risk management review. So review undertakes, we have to first of all assign the responsibility itself. And review process includes that the risk manage plan, management plan, which has been implemented, has it been appropriate or not? The risk from all identified potential hazard situations have been considered or not? <clears throat> the overall residual risk, which has remained, is acceptable or not? And appropriate methods are in place to obtain the information necessary to monitor risk or not. And then finally, number six, risk monitoring. Now, from the action plan which we have developed, which we have thought, which we are going to implement, before implementing it finally, just do a PDSA first. Plan, do, uh, plan, do and act. So when we do this uh, PDSA sample, we can check whether the method is correct or not, whether it is going to help us or not. So check if these risk reduction efforts have been effective or not. Measure the residual risk. Was it according to planned approach or not? Is the residual risk more what we had accept expected? If it is there, take some more action. Establish <clears throat> surveillance system. How are we going to monitor further? <clears throat> then apply some indicators and detect the changes in the risk profile, whether the profile has come from 900 to 20 or lesser or not. Now the question is, when it is to be done, there is so many risk areas in the laboratory. When we think, start thinking about that, the mind get, gets puzzled. So many things to do, how to do, when to do. So there are few guide, few few uh, helps which we which we can learn is that initially, first of all, whenever we are going to start a laboratory or a process or activity, it is to be done. If some incident or accident has happened, we have to assess that. We should do that. Whenever a new equipment, like Dr. Neeraj sir has told, verification of equipment is to be done, IQ, OQ, PQ is to be done. So it is, again, the risk activity, management activity. Any change in the work process, <clears throat> like earlier we were using manual sample labeling, now the system has changed to barcoding, although the upgraded system is there. So... Do we, this new process of barcoding is going to impose some risk? If we are going to uh, change the section alignments from one place to other, the machine is to be placed, the work branches are to be changed. So we can assess that, that time. Once it is stable, frequency can be reduced based on the perceived risk. So what is all residual risk about? <clears throat> the risk remaining after the risk control measures is the residual risk and it is to be in the risk management plan itself it is to be decided that after taking all the actions this particular thing will re will go down to this level and which we have to expect which we have to accept so prior to implementing proposed change it is important to ensure the individual residual residual risk as well as the overall residual risk what is this there there are so many potential causes in each step so every step will impose uh, will give rise to some residual risk so combining all will be the combined residual risk so has it been reduced to acceptable level or not <laughs> so what is all documentation required so many things are to be done so what all is required for the documentation purpose the whole story ends here because every student, whenever we take these lectures, they say, ma'am, please tell us what all is required. What do we have, we have to write in the laboratory? What will the assessor check? So standard tells us that process is to be defined, procedure is to be defined for risk analysis, evaluation, implementation, and verification of risk control measures. The assessment of acceptability of any residual risk. 
So for doing that, what we have learned, we have to, we should do, have some risk metrics or RPN calculator with us. We should have some risk acceptability criteria with us. Tools, which we have used like Fishbone or something else. Management review records, monitoring of risk control measures and other supporting documents like internal audits, the inputs, staff discussions, meetings, huddles, identification tables, et cetera. So when we do so much, what we can say, I have done so much. So I may not be there yet, which we are, which we are expecting, but certainly I am closer to what I was yesterday. So one step, one baby step, one little step definitely takes us ahead. So one step can make all the difference. So thank you so much. Happy Holi.